You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. Photographs of millions of people are being put on a national police database to try to stop criminals escaping detection simply by moving around the country. For the first time ever from March next year, detectives will be able to compare images of suspects with around 16 million photos. The new photo system is an extension of the National Police Database. The database was established in 2011, following the murder of two schoolgirls, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman in Cambridgeshire. Their killer, Ian Huntley, was able to get a job working in a school, even though he had a criminal record because police in Cambridgeshire could not access records from his previous address. Currently, the national database holds information on millions of people who have been convicted, cautioned or arrested, as well as others not suspected or convicted of crimes. Detectives say the new photographic technology is a game-changer, but civil liberties groups are concerned about what data should be held on the database and for how long. Joining me for today's discussion is Nick Pickles, the director of the civil liberties group Big Brother Watch. Ken Lodge is the director of the security firm SIP Services. Rob Hastings is a freelance journalist. And Annie Mashon is a former intelligence officer for MI5. We'll begin with Ken Lodge, the director of the security firm SIP Services. Is this new system Big Brother come true? Well, you've got to realise that what they're saying is regarding this is already there. The information is in with 43 police forces already. Um, it's just that they don't have the facility to exchange the information so easily uh, between the police forces. So this is just a common sense, a movement forward, so that each force has the same amount of access and saves public funds in time in checking up from one force to another. Nick Pickles from Big Brother Watch. Well, I think it goes back to a basic principle that we addressed with the DNA database, is that do the police have the right to indefinitely hold information about people who have never been convicted of a crime and in many cases never charged of any crime? They are innocent to all intents and purposes. And so are the police holding on to information about people who are not suspected of any crime, have never been convicted, and that's a threshold which in a civil society I don't think we should cross. Rob Hastings. I think a lot of people would be quite surprised that the police didn't already have a national database of um, photographs of, and images of um, criminals and suspects and things. I think the main issue is how it's used and, as, as Nick said, the nature of the people that are seeing their pictures uploaded. You know, if it's just an innocent person who's been mistakenly arrested versus, um, you know, a major fugitive, um, I, I think it very much depends on how the images are used. And Annie Mashon. I think um, there is an issue here of potential mission creep and technology creep, where you could have a situation where, yes, we might have a national database at the moment, and so long as it's regulated properly, I don't think many people would be too surprised about it. But if we look at the development of technology and possible future applications, then we could be sliding towards a police state. So, for example, there was a reporting over the summer about a system called Trapwire, which was reported by WikiLeaks where um, information from CCTV and all sorts of other sources could be fed into this centralised database and then track people in real time going about their daily lives on the street. So if you then add on to that intelligent rec image recognition technology, which again is under development, then we would indeed be living in a panoptic police state. Yeah, but I think you're defeating the object here. The main discussion is, should this photograph of suspects uh, in cases, we're talking about protecting the society, different communities, you know, it's okay saying, oh, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do that. But if there is a suspect and he's moved from one county to another and he murders your child or rapes your daughter uh, or is, is a paedophile or whatever, uh, you wouldn't be bit too happy to know that the police had information on that suspect at another location but they didn't have access to it. Well surely this is just about photographs though. I mean this is the point about the police national computer. Yeah. Is that there already is a way of sharing information yeah, across not forces, the photographs. And it's just yeah. forces. So there is an element that says, and if you look at the SOAM um, follow-up investigation, the issue wasn't a lack of data. No, the issue was sharing between yeah, the people. Exactly. So actually 
I think the principle is still there, that the only people whose photos should be stored and put on this database are people who have either been arrested of an offence and are undergoing prosecution, or have been charged with an offence and not yet prosecuted, or have been found guilty. No, but I, I agree to a certain degree. I think if the suspects, or if you like, should be, uh, that go on their photographs that are, are being uh, produced, should uh, be restricted not to mine offences that someone's just been brought in for a suspicion of... He's got to be someone that is a risk to the community. Now, uh, admit that uh, often, many cases, some suspects, uh, there's so much evidence stacked up against them, but for technical reasons, it hasn't gone to prosecution. So these type of suspects, I think, should be on... Uh, photographs should be there, should be available for identification. And when would you... Well, I think it's down to um, an idea of what role the police should have in this. Are they going to be acting as judge and jury as well, in terms of people who are suspects? Um, and again, it goes back to my first point about mission creep. It's all real saying, yes, we need to protect our communities against rapists or paedophiles. But, for example, if the police then start potentially illegally uh, investigating uh, protesters, for example, who they then define illegally again as domestic extremists or terrorists, which is exactly what happened during the Occupy protest in the City of London last year, then how far down the path do we want to go in sharing information about people going around their democratic rights protest in what is supposedly an open society. Rob, are you concerned about how this information is going to be used? I think it depends on the extent of the technology because I think the trapwire system, which was um, exposed by WikiLeaks, um, raised quite an interesting issue as to how much we can really believe the companies that are producing this technology in terms of how capable it actually is. There are lots of articles um, surrounding this issue saying that, yeah, this is the surveillance state has already arrived and, you know, um, there are these vast computer systems that are tracking people across various different states. But then there are other journalists from, I think, the New York Times and the New Scientist who looked more deeply into this, and they said, well, a lot of this is contractors trying to boast to um, the security services, trying to sell their wares. And I think the problem with this issue is so few of us are ever going to see this technology. So if you ever see the images that are captured on these cameras, you know, where they go, who's watching them, is it a person, is it a computer? And then if you take away from that the facial recognition software, I mean, if I get matched against someone that looks like me, but isn't me, you still have to have enough bulk of evidence to then, you know, I'm not just going to get arrested and put in prison because I look like someone. It's all how it's used, and I, th I think that's the main concern. I mean, I was, I was just mugged a couple of years ago, and they caught my muggers by using CCTV. They didn't need facial recognition software in that occasion because the local officers just recognised the criminals. I suppose if I was the victim of crime, I'd like to think that if the images are there and if there's a legitimate reason, you know, if they're used properly, that's a good thing. But I think the mission creep is quite a key. Nick Pickles, the key phrase there, if it's used properly. Well, exactly, and I think facial recognition software is going to change the game here because especially with people using, for example, Facebook now, there is kind of a database of people's pictures already that is people are sharing themselves without considering actually in a few years' time Facebook might want to sell that data to law enforcement agencies. So if Facebook say, you run your facial recognition software from your mugging CCTV straight through Facebook, and that, if that's in the terms and conditions, we know people don't read the terms and conditions, um, is that actually a big step away from the police database? And I think the issue comes back to consent. Do people know what's happening with their image? And why is it being stored? And is it then used for a different purpose? And I think the danger with the police's database is that we often see with these things, the police then have a tool and in a few years' time, local councils start asking for access and different agencies and the tax man and very quickly you have exactly what happened with the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, where just a few agencies had access when it went through Parliament, and now it's more than 100. Very, very different uh, landscape. And if they'd told Parliament, here are the agencies that are going to get access, I think Parliament would have reacted very differently than when they were told it's just for the police and the intelligence agencies. Ken Lodge, this system seems to be possibly then open to abuse. Uh, it, yes, I agree. But, you know, there can be an infrastructure set in where about, uh, there can be restrictions by government uh, to say, um, you know, any, any, any future people requiring access, it has to go back. So it's controlled. Everything can be controlled if it's put in place, uh, which I think it has to be in the very early stages, to avoid abuse. 
And uh, as I say, again, I'm not saying all suspects should be on it, but those that have been related to serious crime, robbery, fraud, um, where, you know, you've got fraudsters going, just as a silly example, going around the community. Uh, from They move from one county to another, and basically all they're doing is taking old pensioners' money through conning them. Now, OK, you might say that that's not serious crime, but on the other hand, you've had pensioners have heart attacks because of this. They've lost all their savings. So, so what's the danger to community? I think everything has to be defined. And then uh, once you've set up a, a qualifier of who goes, the, what, which suspects go on, uh, photographs go on the database, well, then I think that gives you a clearer picture. And providing it is monitored, it is controlled thoroughly, then I think it's a good thing. It's going to help... Uh, victims you know to find out who has committed a crime you're listening to the voice of russia in london with me daniel sinner joining us for a discussion on the new national photographic police database is nick pickles the director of the civil liberties group big brother watch ken lodge is the director of the security firm sip services rob hastings is a freelance journalist, and Annie Mashon is a former intelligence officer for MI5. Annie Mashon, speaking from an intelligence services point of view, how valuable is a system like this for intelligence officers? Well, it would certainly help. I mean, there's no doubt about it when it comes to trying to track terrorists or organised criminals. Um, but of course, we do need the regulation in place to ensure that it's not abused. And that regulation should in- involve, as it used to involve as well with um, interception of communications, the need to get a warrant to do invasive tracking and invasive investigation. Now, interestingly, with the um, facial recognition technology, something that Facebook was trialing in the US is a new system they call FaceDeal, which means that they use facial recognition technology for people on Facebook going into local businesses and restaurants and getting discounts via Facebook because they are regular customers. So Facebook is using its sort of face tagging technology already to do this for commercial purposes. And particularly interestingly, in some of the European countries, um, such as Germany and France, this type of um, unregulated face tagging, facial recognition, has now been deemed to be illegal under the terms of the constitution of those countries. Now, of course, we don't have the same degree of protection under any sort of British constitution because it's not written down. So I think the other commentator is absolutely right. There needs to be uh, parameters within which these technologies can be rolled out. Unfortunately, we don't tend to have them so much in the UK. What we have is ministers like Damien Green talking about the um, use of spy drones over protests, saying that they will be used in a proportionate manner. Well, what does that mean? That needs to be legally nailed down ahead of the technology and the legislation coming in to use that technology. If you were tracking an organised criminal and you had access to a, a database which was connected to Facebook, but you weren't quite sure who this one person was and it was integrated with these other systems, surely it would help reduce and solve crimes? Well, absolutely. I mean, Facebook itself is, you know, the spy's wet dream. (laughs) People are voluntarily offering over information that spies used to take years to collate. So, um, as I said, there is no doubt that there is a need to investigate and to capture terrorists and organized criminals. And this is what the spy community is supposed to be doing. But they're already surrounded by a number of laws that are supposed to rein them in and ensure it's done in an evidential, warranted way. Um, unfortunately, some of this new technology, it strikes me as, well, we have these new toys, let's use it. And so one of the other aspects about trap wire, for example, is not just the facial recognition technology. It's also predictive behavioral technology they're building into it, has been reported. Now, it might not be perfect yet, um, but it could mean that if you are recognized walking or acting or loitering in a suspicious manner somewhere, then they could tag you and say this person might be a suspected terrorist, protester, domestic extremist, or whatever. And this, is, this could be a major problem. And even if the technology is not perfect yet, it will be in a few years. And I think for the public uh, debate, we need to be aware of where we're going, how we can control this new technology, how we can protect the citizenry. I mean, the, the need for privacy is not uh, is a right. I mean, the, the idea of privacy is this is a right. It's not an indication necessarily of wrongdoing. Rob Hastings, do you think that the public might be willing to sacrifice their photos on Facebook for the fact that they might be safer? I think most people's reaction to this is obviously that that CCTV isn't just put there to invade people's privacy. It's put there for a very real purpose, which is to try and make people people safer. And I, I think that is, you know, if you search CCTV in Google News, 
the majority of the results of that are individual cases that are being solved day in, day out by the use of CCTV. But obviously, in the meantime, people's images are being tracked, you know, down every street they walk down in a major city. I, I think can I, on the... Sorry, can I just interject there? Because um, the head of the um, department within the Metropolitan Police a couple of years ago went on the record and said that CCTV is only used, actually, to solve about 3% of street crime. Mm. And, in fact, since CCTV, CCTV has been rolled out across the UK over the last decade or 15 years, um, the incidence of violent crime has gone up on the streets of the UK. So people might feel safer because they can see CCTV all over the streets, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are safer. Rob, did you want to come back to that? Yeah, well, I'd say this is exactly the, the, the issue, that you know, it might, it might um, solve a few crimes, but we don't know if it pushes violent crime outside of the areas that do have the cameras into other areas. I mean, it's such a complex issue um, in terms of human behavior <laughs> that's that's ultimately what you're trying to deal with here as much as the technology you know how people respond to uh, the technology that's being installed the other thing I'd say is that this isn't necessarily all that new that obviously the technology is developing and we've got vastly better capabilities than in previous years but I mean there was a facial recognition system that was trialed in Newham in 1998 and there was national press um, attention, you know, brought to that. Obviously, the difference is now if you've got C um, HD CCTV cameras that are much better able to pick up people's face, um, facial sort of, you know, the logarithms and and um, the various different mathematical formulas that can be used to identify people. And if cameras are being placed specifically to use facial recognition systems, um, for example, if they're being placed in a tube tunnel. Um, at quite a low level so that you know that everyone is going to be walking towards them face on for the purposes of scanning the faces and, and you know, comparing them to a database. Obviously, that's quite different to a very high level, grainy sort of CCTV camera just generally monitoring what's going on. But we're also deviating to a certain degree because these photographer suspects are already on police files in the 43 uh, forces. All they're doing is saying, hey, listen, we're extracted the information from the 43 forces to put them into one database so each force has access to them. So I, the, the, you've got to remember the data is, uh, the, the photographs are already there, already being used, and it, the advantage is that it means that every force does have access, and so if someone goes across the county, they can all be so monitored. I think that actually highlights one of the big problems we have got in Britain is that the actual existing operation of the police is proving quite outdated. So for example looking at the way the police deal with electronic crime if you have your credit card skimmed and someone starts spending money online trying to get help from your local police force is a nightmare. They don't have the skills, they don't have the resources um, I mean when the commissioner of the Met Police was asked about what he would spend an extra £1.8 billion pounds on he talked about police IT being more green screen than iPad and saying that actually police IT probably doesn't stop a lot of crime and solve a lot of crimes because their existing infrastructure is very poor. So mm. I think that the two issues are, one is let's give the police the technology they need to do the job, but the information that is stored by that technology needs to be very, very regulated. So I think the one test I would set is that the information shouldn't be uploaded to a central database until the police have gone through and said that person was released, never charged, um, never even taken to court, that data, that photo doesn't go on the central database, but that person was convicted of murder, yes, that photo goes on the central database. I think the police need to actually control the data before the same court cases will happen with photographs as happened with DNA, and the police will be forced to delete them eventually. Yeah, but I, as I said before, a lot of, lot of suspects, uh, and I'm not talking about someone that's just been called in because of a connection for an association with someone that has been convicted, but a lot of suspects do ultimately get off on either technical issues uh, or, or, or... That's, that's the justice but, system, though, isn't it? Uh, I mean, yeah, if yeah, coppers sit there and say, but, I don't like I what know, the court says... No, no, but then at the same time, it, with that neither says the, the man is innocent still. He, OK, that doesn't well, mean to say he's not guilty and he's, I mean, he's not been proven either way. Well, but no, he I, wasn't proven guilty. No, that's no, kind of the point no, and the principle of no, no, you are but, innocent but, until but proven if, guilty. But, but if there are key issues that have implemented that person in a crime and there's a risk that that person could repeat the crime in another county. That's why I think it's important. So on the DNA it's already case. there. The information is already there with the photograph in that one police force. 
So that's not going away. That's already there. Well, and actually, it should go away over a period. The Met, Sorry, the Met yeah. Police were actually challenged in court yeah. about that exact point, and the Met Police were told you must delete photographs Absolutely. of people mm. who were never charged. Um, I think the one thing that actually is useful yeah. is that if the police want to keep photographs after someone has been found not guilty in court, they can ask the court for permission to keep the photograph, which is exactly how the new DNA system will work. Yes. Ken, it's apparent, obviously, that Nick Pickles want, from Big Brother Watch wants uh, strict regulation on how we can use these photos and how long we hold the photos yeah, I for. I would agree. you share those concerns? I would, I would, I would share it to a degree. I, I, I'm not, I, I, I do believe that it should be structured in a way that the people that the photographs are retained have, say, gone to a certain level of a type of an offence that they were suspected of. So you don't think it's worth holding all these photos just in case they re-offend down the line? Uh, uh, re-offending, certainly. I've, I think they should be a, a, t a time scan on it, uh, whether it's eight years or whatever. But uh, yes, there should be a time period in which they're held and then fine uh, if after a period of time it and it's not proven that you, that they have been involved in a crime of a similar nature well then fine they should be removed i'm not disputing that You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. Joining us for a discussion on the new National Photographic Police Database is Nick Pickles, the director of the Civil Liberties Group Big Brother Watch. Ken Lodge is the director of the security firm SIP Services. Rob Hastings is a freelance journalist and Annie Mashon is a former intelligence officer for MI5. Annie Mashon, how do you think that these photos should be dealt with? I would tend to agree with what Nick has been saying, that um, there are already mechanisms in place that if someone is still, even if they're acquitted, but there are serious concerns, then perhaps there can be some sort of court oversight or court order, a bit like when you want to investigate and intrude on someone's private communications. There should be a court order to do that. Um, and I do get the point as well that Ken was making, that all these photographs already exist. It's just putting them in one big database. I suppose the, the key issue for me is trying to think ahead a few years as technology evolves and how it could be abused. So it's all very well saying, well, this is what we've got at the moment, we're just centralising it, but we do need to be aware of technological trends, we do need to be aware of surveillance trends and how they could be abused, because we have been seeing mission creep, not just in the UK, but the US mm. uh, very infamously um, has been data mining its entire systemry. So it's those sort of issues that need, I would suggest, a very strong and thoughtful and in-depth public debate so that people can work forward in a constructive and proportionate but also legal way. And that's something that the British, the British government is not necessarily always very good at doing. I would say to the, the government's um, slight credit, they are beginning to sort of take this issue on board in terms of um, creating some sort of oversight of CCTV. I, was, I interviewed the Britain's new surveillance commissioner, Andrew Renison, um, last month, and I was quite struck by the fact that this... Um, former police officer who uh, part of his role is actually to improve CCTV systems to make them better at being able to fight crime. Alongside that, he was also very, very strong in saying, yes, we need this public debate. We need to be absolutely sure, you know, what we're introducing here. And we need to bring in very strict regulations so that as the technology gets better, we do have better systems of ensuring it's used properly. And, you know, he's been brought in by the government. Some would argue that his powers at the moment aren't strong enough. But I think it's a good start to, you know, to recognise that as this new technology comes in, we need to, to better um, control the way it's used, who's using it, that sort of thing. He, he also serves as the government's forensic science regulator. And I think that that's quite interesting in, in showing there are so many different strands of evidence um, that can be used against anyone in one single case. And the fact that he's also being, you, you know, looking into sort of CSI type science, you know, capturing people's DNA and things, that he's, he's simultaneously looking at CCTV and DNA. He spoke to me about gait analysis, which is trying to identify people by the way they walk. It fits into a much wider argument over what sort of police powers we want in this country, I would say. Well, the other issue we do need to think about, potentially, is um, how to secure these big databases. Mm. Because, of course, there have been a number of scandals over the last few years in the UK and other countries where um, major public databases contain very private information about citizens who are innocent until proven guilty um, are not necessarily secured because the systems are just not up to the job. They can be easily hacked, they can be taken down. Um, USB sticks can contain lots of it, take, you know, filled up and taken away, containing lots of private information. So it's also thinking about the 
privacy rights of citizens whose information is stored on that database. And that's a whole different discussion, I think. Nick yeah. Pickles, just briefly to go to you, because you've, you've discussed this before about how information should be held. How would you like to see this database being protected? Well, I think we've still got one big absence in the UK, which is uh, if you breach the Data Protection Act and deliberately obtain someone's personal information, which includes a picture, and then release that data, you cannot be sent to prison. It's actually on the statute book that breaching the Data Protection Act should be and is a criminal offence punishable by prison, but the government hasn't ordered that power to come into effect. I think that's a glaring deficiency in the fact that, you know, if we look at the phone hacking saga, all the issues there are already criminal acts, but not a single person has actually been sent to jail yet. And we have Leveson dealing with this situation when it should have been the police. So let's protect the data with the proper penalties. And then let's actually get the police looking at this, because a lot of the time it's the information commissioner, who's not a, a law enforcement body in that sense. Let's get a police force that's got the skills to say, if you did you know, leave a, uh, I think this happened before the Olympics, the counter-terror strategy for the Olympics on the tube, then it isn't just a slap on the wrist issue anymore. Um, data is far more valuable than is currently being, uh, currently being demonstrated by, I think, the government's attitude and too many public sector organisations' attitudes towards dip disciplining their staff when things go wrong. There seems to be a bit of a, of a dampener as we get to the end of this discussion about how effective this database is. Broadly, do you accept it and do you welcome it? Yes, I do. I do. I, I, I just say providing parameters of accessibility, who has the right for the information uh, put in place in the early stages. Uh, and if they want to add, uh, give access to other bodies, well, then that has to be approved by a body before it's done, sir. Um, and also there's put in place the uh, a status before that person goes on. I think the photograph image is good. Nick Pickles from Big Brother Watch. Let's put a law in place that says whose picture can be added to the database and then let's make sure that law is adhered to. And then officers abusing that database, give you one example, more than I think 100 officers in one police force had to be disciplined when the media reported a footballer had been arrested and more than 100 staff jumped onto the police's database to try and guess who the footballer was. Now in that situation, that's totally unacceptable and we need to treat those, those misdemeanours with far more um, intensity. And as Annie says, that goes for the intelligence services. The oversight of how data is used and abused in this country is woefully lacking at present. Rob Hastings. Yes, I'd agree that if we have a, a systematic um, set of controls over you know, how someone is put on the database, how that's accessed, I, I would say it seems entirely sensible in this day and age that we, that we use that sort of system. And Annie Mashon. I go with the old quote, those who give away their liberties for their security deserve neither. And I do think that more and more people are waking up to these sort of issues as surveillance technology grows and develops and becomes more pervasive. So I welcome any you know, further public debate on these issues. I think we're, we're all becoming very aware of them. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for today's discussion. Thank you to all of my guests, Nick Pickles, the director of the Civil Liberties Group Big Brother Watch, Ken Lodge, the director of the security firm SIP Services, Rob Hastings is a freelance journalist, and Annie Mashon is a former intelligence officer for MI5. Force has the same amount of access and saves public funds in time in checking up from one force to another. Nick Pickles from Big Brother Watch. Well, I think it goes back to a basic principle that we addressed with the DNA database, is that do the police have the right to indefinitely hold information about people who have never been convicted of a crime and in many cases never charged of any crime? They are innocent to all intents and purposes. And so are the police holding on to information about people who are not suspected of any crime, have never been convicted, and that's a threshold which in a civil society I don't think we should cross. Rob Hastings. I think a lot of people would be quite surprised that the police didn't already have a national database of um, photographs of, and images of um, criminals and suspects and things. I think the main issue is how it's used and, as, as Nick said, the nature of the people that are seeing their pictures uploaded. You know, if it's just an innocent person who's been mistakenly arrested versus, um, you know, a major fugitive... Um, I, I think it very much depends on how the images are used. And Annie Mashon. I think um, there is an issue here of 
potential mission creep and technology creep where you could have a situation where, yes, we might have a national database at the moment, and so long as it's regulated properly, I don't think many people would be too surprised about it. But if we look at the development of technology and possible future applications, then we could be sliding towards a police state. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. Photographs of millions of people are being put on a national police database to try to stop criminals escaping detection simply by moving around the country. For the first time ever from March next year, detectives will be able to compare images of suspects with around 16 million photos. The new photo system is an extension of the national police database. The database was established in 2011, following the murder of two schoolgirls, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman in Cambridgeshire. Their killer, Ian Huntley, was able to get a job working in a school, even though he had a criminal record, because police in Cambridgeshire could not access records from his previous address. Currently, the national database holds information on millions of people who have been convicted, cautioned or arrested, as well as others not suspected or convicted of crimes. Detectives say the new photographic technology is a game-changer, but civil liberties groups are concerned about what data should be held on the database and for how long. Joining me for today's discussion is Nick Pickles, the director of the civil liberties group Big Brother Watch. Ken Lodge is the director of the security firm SIP Services. Rob Hastings is a freelance journalist. And Annie Mashon is a former intelligence officer for MI5. We'll begin with Ken Lodge, the director of the security firm SIP Services. Is this new system Big Brother come true? Well, you've got to realise that what they're saying is regarding this is already there. The information is in, with 43 police forces already. Um, it's just that they don't have the facility to exchange the information so easily uh, between the police forces. So this is just a common sense, a movement forward, so that each 